Welcome to the panel, The Sustainable Impact of Placemaking, uh, which is part of the second Mannheim Placemaking Forum. It is 4 p.m. sharp. Um, however, um, maybe we give the audience another five minutes to join. Um, since we are doing everything online, we're kind of used to being on time, but, uh, or maybe it's only the Germans, I don't know. But um, just give the audience another five minutes until we kick off this panel. So everybody who's already there, welcome and great to have you. Right, so there are people still joining. It's very great, great to have you. They're coming in. The more the merrier, that's perfect. Another two to three minutes, and then we're gonna kick off this panel. So welcome everybody who's joining, just a few minutes, and then we start off with the panel on the sustainable impact of placemaking. So since there are still a few people joining, just give it another minute and then we kick it off. So, 
I think we're ready to go. I'd like to welcome all of you, the panelists and the audience, the virtual audience, to the second panel of the second Mannheim Placemaking Forum. Today, we're going to talk on the sustainable impact of placemaking. And we want to address on how creative placemaking can be sustainable and have lasting impacts on community and places. And not frequently, not infrequently encountered critical perspective on creative placemaking projects relates to their limited scope and their ephemerality. On the one hand, placemaking projects are highly changeable and adaptable. And on the other hand, they can be seen as impermanent. And during this panel, we will try to tackle the question whether and under which circumstances temporary impulses and interventions can also result in sustainable effects on public spaces and communities. And before I hand over to our first speaker, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is, my name is Anna Bleich, and I'm a project manager for the Cultural Innovation Office at Next Mannheim. And I'm especially focusing on cross-innovation projects. And for the audience, it's great to have you, even though we can't see you. And if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. And after the panel, we try to answer as many questions as possible. And before we kick it off into our discussion, I'd like to introduce Maria adebouwale schwarte and she will give us a short input on One Planet, Equitable Placemaking and Sustainability. Maria is the CEO of the Foundation for Future London, and she's a placemaking and grant strategist with over 25 years cross-sector experience in heritage, human rights, improving urban places and green spaces. Her book, The Placemaking Factor, explores the role of philanthropy in unlocking siloed approaches to funding. Also, she sits on several governance boards of organizations and advisory groups to hold strong place-led sustainable development, culture and heritage focus, including the National Lottery Heritage Fund, Environment Agency, the Mayor of London Sustainable Development Commission, leading on social value rate generation and City of London's Culture and Commerce Task Force. So there's a lot of knowledge there. And Maria, I'm really happy to have you. And I'm really looking forward to your input, which you're going to give us for the next like 15 minutes. And the stage is yours. Please feel free. And um, you have to put on your microphone, please. Oh, that perfect. would help, wouldn't it? I'm muting. That's always helpful. Sorry. Um, I must make my bio shorter. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to just start with kind of um, a little bit of background and it's how I got here. And I'm being to see how other people got to this conversation. I think when I was younger, I assumed that um, being an, wanting to be an architect meant that I couldn't be involved in um, being an environmentalist either. I don't know quite where I got that from. I think when you're younger, you're told it's one thing or another in your career. Um, and as we get older, we realize actually everything's interconnected. And I think the thing, the reason why I'm a placemaker is that that's one of the places where everything is interconnected. The environment, sustainability, arts and culture, how we treat each other. And I remember coming across in a, in a geography class um, when I was younger, and we were talking about Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. And I don't know if you've heard of that, some of you might have done. But it talks about how as humans, we actually self-actualize, how we become who we are and the, and the things that we need to be human. And I'll just mention some of those. Um, physical, we need air, water, food, rest, health, security, shelter, stability, social, the need to be loved, belong, and be included. Then we need something around our ego. We need the self-esteem. We need power, recognition, and prestige. And then ultimately, we need self-actualization. We need the ability to have space for development and creativity. And it seems to me that placemaking offers all of those things. Not only that, it shapes the world in which we live in if we do it properly. The habitat where we live is an absolute basic for human need. It's how we move forward into the future, and it's how we shape the balance of the way in which we protect the environment, our economy, and people. There's a lot of conversation right now about net zero, and I think there should be. 
we need to know as placemakers how we create that balance between greenhouse gas production and the amount removed from the atmosphere. What's our role in that? So as a funder and fundraiser for the Foundation of Future London, we're looking at how do we use creativity, arts, culture, as well as traditional placemaking to create global and local significance. We think our vision needs to be vi bright and vibrant, but we need to be really authentic about places. They need to be inclusive and they need to be co-designed. Well, we work with four boroughs, amazing diverse local communities in East London, Hackney, Newham, Town Hamlets and Waltham Forest, along with our cultural East Bank partners. We're working in a new cultural space, and these are some of the things that we are focusing on, and this is why. We think, as I said, placemaking needs to be co-designed and participatory. If we're to save the planet, no one person, no one country can decide how we do that. This needs to be an approach which has common agreement around. And placemaking, I think, develops that sweet spot. If you think about it, Where's the biggest place? It's Earth, planet Earth. And here in that conversation around place and planet Earth, we can talk about the environment, fair economics, and how we accelerate everyone so they're able to have that decision process, but also so they can actually have value and be part of that conversation in the clean and healthy environment. We know place is an open book. It allows us for broader thinking and dimensions of thinking. We can be emotional and we can empower and we can own our conversations. The next thing I think around placemaking is that we often talk about shared spaces. And I think we're pretty good actually at going from the local to global, because if we're to talk about sustainability, we have to understand not only our local neighborhoods, but we have to also understand the people living in the North and the South, the East and the West. And the way we shape our spaces has to be collaborative and make sure that those people are also involved. Economy. If you think about the creative economy in London, for example, it's worth over 35 million pounds, in fact, billions. It secures job security. It creates careers in architecture, planning, digital urbanization, and also has an immense connection to diversity. What we're doing now is trying to make sure if we're to actually have an equitable placemaking approach to sustainable development, and it's something actually as a foundation that my team have always done, is to make sure that we have diverse voices at the table. We have immense talents in our countries and across the universe. We need to be more involved with women, with people who are neurodiverse, LGBTQ+, working class, Black, brown, Asian, ethnic, ethnic minorities, we all have answers to create a cleaner environment. And if we're to protect the environment, we also need to make sure that we understand the wider diversity. How do we create spaces? How do we place make whilst protecting the planet? How do we create places that are climate resilient? How do we create places that are climate resilient and also revitalize neighborhoods. We know from our experience at the Foundation for Future London that art and creativity is one of those things. We fund outdoor spaces, which are absolutely crucial as actually for artworks, for outdoor galleries. And actually now, as we all know with COVID-19, it's been absolutely crucial that open spaces, green spaces, gray spaces are open to everyone. Across my work over time, I found there are a number of things that need to happen to have placemaking with a sustainable development heart. I call them red pins. The things we need to do is develop a relationship, not only between ourselves as humans, but also improve our relationship with the planet. We are its protectors. Everything we do needs to be equitable and sustainable. We need equal access for everyone around the planet, north and south, to have environmental goods. The way we design needs to be at human scale, and that might be different in different countries, but we need to recognize that. In every town and city around the globe, there needs to be public realm. We're realizing now in COVID-19 or post-COVID-19, we hope, 
is a public realm and spaces are where people meet. It's where they have conversations. It's often the place where they will have the biggest relationship with the environment, their local environment. I've said already that it also has to be inclusive. Sustainability ultimately is about the right to a clean and healthy environment for current and future generations. And that will also include tackling issues that seem to us quite basic, but placemaking has to be around making people feel safe. For the foundation, we follow three goals for sustainable development. You might not be surprised, SDG 11, making cities and human health settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. We want to ensure inclusive and equitable education and promote lifelong learning for SDG 4. For us, we fund a lot of educational programs and that's to get new generations into placemaking, whether that's regeneration, whether that's creativity, whether that's innovation, whether that's health. But if you think about it, all of those things are absolutely crucial for lifelong learning and clean and healthy environments. The final specific SDG 11 is SDG 8. We're trying to promote a sustained and inclusive, sustainable economic growth. It has to be productive and it has to create decent work. And that what place, that's what placemaking needs to do too. The thing I enjoy most about meeting people and conversations around place is that I think we think outside the box and we need to do that for net zero. We look at so many things. We look at planning, sustainable development and social value. We create access to spaces and places. We put people together through wellbeing projects, through training, through creativity, putting people together in a space with their families and friends or just being. In the UK, and I'm sure in the countries that you're also in, we're talking about social prescribing. And that is about actually rather than pills, it's places. Doctors and nurses and the health sector are prescribing people going out into the local environment, joining programs which are around health, placemaking and green spaces. We think placemaking, placemaking is a catalyst and it's focused on building back better with no one left behind. And that surely is the same message for sustainability. A while ago, I was lucky enough to work with some colleagues um, and with a book called Countering Exclusion in Public Spaces. And some of you will know that already. A big focus in this work was about illustrating the benefits of nature and green spaces and urban walks, but also making sure that that capability was one that was actually open to everyone. If we're to be sustainable placemakers, if we're to ensure that sustainability happens now, then we need to break down some of those issues that actually counter in exclusion. And I think sometimes as placemakers, we don't think often enough about that. Public spaces can act as a canvas, an art, as I said, social prescription, safe homes, but also tackling the big sticky issues like climate and flooding and resilience. If we think about planning alone, a lot of placemaking is about reforming a space, reforming land. We need to drive for more informed and fit for purpose planning reforms. They're crucial to making sure we build back better, safer, faster and equitably. At the center of a good planning system, urban planning system, placemakers need to ensure that we embed, as I said, social value, environment net gains and partnerships at scale. It's understandable that there are fears sometimes around how we're going to do this. How are we going to slim down as in the planet? How are we going to slim down in regards to other way in which we not only design spaces, but in the way in which we consume? Developers, planners and placemakers have a vital role in ensuring that we invest in environmental infrastructure and policy and that we're ambi very ambitious about net zero. We need to tackle the data analysis. What does it mean when we build a space? Is it engaging? Are we using digital mapping in a way which is informed, which also supports and recognizes knowledge equity? Finally, if I'm thinking about investment, and I am constantly as someone who's working for an organization which not only funds programs, but fundraisers for programs, 
then we need to be focused on EESG. Now, some of you will think of it as ESG, but for us and for me at the foundation, actually, we're talking about environment, that's the first E, and equity, that's the second, sustainable ability and good governance. They're all equal on the platform. And that's the foundation that all placemakers need to use. It's certainly one that the foundation does. Crucially, neighborhoods are our DNA. We often read them in a way as grassroots, policy level, sustainable development interventions, and they're crucial financial investments. As a funder and investor, we are focused and committed to holding up shared responsibilities for current and future generations. And we do this by working with partners across London, also local to global, and we're looking at partnerships with other countries too. So for us, philanthropy also has a role. So for any of you out there who are philanthropists or charitable foundations, we say to you, economically, you are absolutely vital in investing in support for placemaking that's focused on net zero and a clean and healthy environment for this future and future futures. So more recently, to finish, we had a report in England by the Environment Agency. They noted our actions need to be now. There are stark but honest messages. Theirs was adopt or die. This is also a stark message, I believe, for placemakers. We have a similar message for local and global placemaking. We're not talking about a nice to have, we're talking about the future and the people of the planet. So thank you, Maria, very much for this great input on your work, but also on sustainability and the ability of placemaking in the whole process. And now kicking off the discussion, I would love our other panelists to join the, um, yeah, the virtual stage. So I would love you to, have to, to put on your camera. And as I introduce you, so first, I'd like to introduce Anna Somadal. She's an urban planner specialized in sustainable urban development, culture and projects and process management. And now she's working as a strategist of outdoor and indoor facilities at the Departments of Culture and Leisure in the countryside municipality Valentuna in the Stockholm region. And by working strategic and operational with facilities of culture, leisure and sports, she contributes to the municipality's social sustainability. Anna, it's great to have you on this panel. Yes, nice to see you all. <laughs> great. Next Thank one. You. Next up, I'd like to introduce Jana Schlender. And she's a passionate change maker and she's experienced in developing and managing projects in the field of circular economy, participation, and empowerment at various NGOs and social enterprises. At the intersection of culture, politics, and civil society, she curated international projects with social actors and policymakers. And as, an, as a studied cultural anthropologist, activist, and placemaking Europe leader, Jana is also committed to the circular economy, participatory urban design, and the promotion of civic engagement through co creation and community building. Jana, it's also great to have you on this virtual stage. Thank you, great to be here. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Alexander Stolle, and he's one of the most popular and well-known speakers on urban futures and design in Scandinavia. He holds a PhD in urban design and is CEO of the design studio Spacescape at the and the dialogue platform Place to Plan, also in Stockholm, and has been working with the most complex urban development projects in Scandinavia. And just one thing I would like to highlight is that he lives in St Stockholm and especially highlighted no car, which I think is really great. And maybe come back to this one later in our panel discussion. So also welcome to you, Alexander. Thank you. So kicking it off, and as the title of our panel predetermines, today we want to talk on the sustainable impact of placemaking. And unfortunate, unfortunately, due to its temporary, Placemaking is often accused of producing only short-term changes without being sustainable. 
And therefore, I'd like to kick off with a question to all of you, and maybe you can keep it like really short in two to three sentences. So from your experience, more generally spoken, what does it take to generate a sustainable impact with placemaking projects? Whoever would like to start. <laughs> We're all being very polite, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> I can start? No, I didn't raise yeah. my hand in the... Okay, this is how to do it. <laughs> it's really hard to do it in so few sentences. Uh, but I think uh, one thing that I've been constantly doing while I've been working is to educate people about how to do placemaking. So making these temporary interventions as an opportunity to educate. Uh, and in the, in the organization you're in, but also the people that you collaborate with. So I think that's something that I did when I worked in Uppsala municipality, both in the urban development department, the different units, but also like the civil sector and the private sector. And, and um, I would not say that all is uh, <laughs> thanks to me, but now they're working with placemaking in really different ways in Uppsala. So both from the civil sector and the private and the municipality. So I think, yeah, educate <laughs> is one way. Great, thank you. Okay, maybe I can um, continue. I think to, to get place making things to be sustainable, I think it's really about uh, uh, doing what fits the place. So if you do something which really fits a place and it's contents, I mean, social context and cultural context and spatial, uh, the thing that you do maybe temporary can be become permanent. So I really believe in making a very clear vision about a place, how it could be in the future, making very like fast, quick, cheap, temporary things which you know can be made permanent. So, so that's, I think, a, a key to making things hold for a long time is uh, everything that you do, even if you like put up some shares, uh, you, you should have the idea, could these be here forever? <laughs> like, yeah, so, and, and then I have some ideas about financing and so on, but then maybe we'll come on to that. Okay, yeah, just don't tell everything yet. So we have something to discuss. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Yeah, I would also like to add that um, engaging people and encouraging people to get involved and to get active and um, give them some sort of ownership of their own environment and their well-being at the, at the center, that really helps to um, seed these... Um, ideas to grow and if we i mean placemaking at the core of placemaking is a um people approach so so this uh, is the best uh, and most sustainable way of uh, implementing <laughs> ideas and creative uh, solutions for for um, a space or an area yeah i mean i agree with everyone um i also think there's there's a conversation happening now in london and other cities uh, um, in the uk and we're talking about social value regeneration now lots of people don't like the word regeneration because you know it's it has bad memories for some people <laughs> maybe some of us so we're using placemaking um but the whole conversation is about actually the way in which it it lands re really well is to make sure that we start to think of it as not necessarily just placemaking on its own, but something which brings social value long-term. And the reason why it does that, as people have already said, is that we're involving local communities, local economy in designing what places should look like, what they should provide, what they should provide for now, but also for the future. And so we're looking into something we're calling social value regeneration, and that's been led by the London Sustainable Development Commission. And there's a whole series of methodologies, but if you want a future for placemaking, then it has to be, I think, around developing a model um, which is about recognizing that we can't do place 
actually only on a kind of program basis, but it's it's for the long term. And to do that, it has to be co-designed and co-owned by people outside of our careers, basically. Um, local communities have to be absolutely part of that. And all the research that we're showing is, is showing that good places that last have been co-developed, not only with placemakers or planners but actually when they're designed by local people who know what they need and the best way to design something. Yeah thank you everybody for starting right away into the topic and, and there's a lot of things mentioned by you I think we will dive a little bit deeper into in the following conversation and so to get into the topic of sustainability I would like to take four of the 17 sustainable development goals by the United Nations <laughs> A little closer look regarding placemaking and Maria, in your input, you already mentioned some SDGs you are focusing on. And I guess a lot of work, whether it's placemaking or something else, is focusing right now on the SDGs. And I think they are an important framework kind of for not only for placemaking, but for urban planning, urban design in general and living together in society. And so I want to kick it off with focusing or have a closer look on the SDGs 3 and 10, which say good health and well-being and also reduced inequalities. And um, Maria, you just kicked it off um, talking about social value regulations and connected communities and also connecting different communities for um, fulfilling or for being sustainable. And how can placemaking be a tool for those topics you mentioned already? Um, so I, I think there's a couple of things, but I won't go into too many of them. Um, I think the SDGs have been really useful because they tell a story in a way that we haven't done that well on as environmentalists sometimes. Um, and the environmental movement, certainly when I was a bit younger, felt quite exclusive and I could um, give you some experiences that I had as, as someone with, with brown, black skin in the environmental sector and the assumption that, you know, um, only certain communities or people care about the environment. I think what we're finding now when we're talking about sustainable development is that everyone cares about, about how we create human settlements. Um, for me, I think that the main thing is actually something around SDG4. Um, I think it's interesting, which is inclusive and um, equitable quality in education and lifelong learning, because I think the skills of a placemaker require all of those things. Um, and then obviously SDG 11, which is about cities and human settlements and resilience and resilience in the time of climate change is absolutely crucial. Um, <laughs> If you think about it really, we talk about creativity, I think nearly all of us have talked about something creative in the way. Um, it's interesting that creativity in itself didn't have its own SDG. And yes, it's a massive connector through every single one of them. So if I think if I had my, you know, if I had, um, I don't know, lots more power, I would get all of us and plenty of other people and communities to actually come up with a new SDG, which is around creativity and its role in sustainable development. Thank you. Jana, you already raised your hand, or may I just address a question to you, or you want to add something? Uh, I just I, I just would like to add to that conversation that I'm a bit confused that people say that um, placemakers or placemaking is, uh, is now looking at the SDGs. I think it's so intrinsic in the, you know, placemaking addresses uh, at least three uh, SDGs at the same time with um, maybe a little bit different uh, angle, but uh, so uh, I would strongly disagree that now we are focusing on the SDGs. It's been there all the time. That's like uh, so intrinsic on placemaking to me. It maybe, yep. now, it maybe now has a name kind of, which was already, always there, but now it has kind of a name and it's not only placemaking now, but feels like the, the whole world now is following the SDGs. And um, yeah, that's right. So um, maybe Jana to add a question. So you are also focusing on civil participation and building commun uh, committed communities. And what is your experience regarding the intersection of placemaking and those topics mentioned, especially focusing on sustainability? Um, well, I think it's, 
also uh, one thing that we always focus on when we do placemaking is to uh, co-create and to involve uh, people and uh, encourage, encourage them to uh, get active. And I think it's um, very uh, like on either topic, like for example, sustainability, I used to work for um, a social company in Neukölln, which is a district uh, in Berlin that has quite some issues uh, also on uh, sustainability ethic, uh, um, aspects. And we address those um, through really connecting with the people and um, involving the people. So there is a strong connection. And if we make the, the environment of the people more livable, then mm -hmm. we also make it more sustainable most of the time. So um, like uh, Maria uh, already said, like COVID showed us one more time how important it is to have green cities, um, uh, but also when it comes to uh, walkability and public transportation and things like that, this always uh, has a sustainable or ecological aspect in it. So it's, to me, it's very easy to um, connect those two uh, aspects actually. Alexander, you just wanted to add something here? So I have a question. Like, uh, is this is this topic? Could it concern like children or old people or like when you talk about uh, what is inclusive? Because I think uh, uh, in a very concrete way, uh, public space in our cities are now very. Um, S segregated in terms that it's almost impossible for small children to move around by themselves. Mm. Uh, I, I think that's a, such a major thing. As, as it's it's so sick that we can't <laughs> we get used to the thing uh, and we don't see it. Uh, however, when you look at like movie uh, movies from hundred years ago, you know there were children everywhere running around in the streets, playing in the streets, like as Jane Jacobs has said. <laughs> and so, so I, I think uh, uh, like how, I think there's a challenge how to make children more uh, to participate in these placemaking processes and how to talk to children or like how, how do we value their, their opinions and uh, how do we value parents' opinions and so on? So I, th I think um, uh, it's, it's a real challenge to, to um, like, yeah, integrate children into the process, I think. Yeah, of course. Um, Anna, maybe before you can um, add your comment, I would also like to ask a question for you, which kind of, I think, really fits into what Alexander just said, because um, to create those inclusive spaces, it is crucial to listen to the requirements of the people in the real of a certain space. And Anna, you are working in the municipality context. So from your experience, so you, I guess, kind of experienced top-down activities, but also bottom-up activities. And so from your experience, what are the pros and cons for either top-down or bottom-up, which is kind of what Alexander just addressed to, to listen to, for example, kids and to include them in those um, yeah, activities. Yes, I think uh, <laughs> so many questions in one. Um, I think that I'm at the moment at the right place to work with kids and youth because I am at the culture and leisure department. So um, at the moment we actually have um, this big project um, that is a collaboration with outside consultants and the municipality, which is about riskful play and uh, for kids to be able to take risks when they're playing. So that's a project where we really involve a lot of kids uh, I, I have not been a part of that involvement because I haven't worked there for more than one year. But so, so uh, working at the Culture and Leisure, we have a constant contact with schools and uh, youth houses and um, associations working with kids and youth uh, and also um, uh, culture activities. So we kind of have, we have the networks and we meet people. So for us, it's kind of a natural way of working. So even though the people I'm working with not, are not uh, talking about placemaking, a lot of how they work and what they how they think, it's kind of placemaking. So I think 
for the uh, urban development department, for example, to collaborate more with culture and leisure, then it's possible to involve youth and kids in a more natural and easy way. So I think I kind of found the key here. <laughs> Great, so we carry on that key you found and we carry through our panel. Maria, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one thing to, way to do it is to make sure that we, we work in partnership with schools. And um, we fund quite a lot of schools and young people to get involved in placemaking. And that's where I think that sometimes foundations and businesses or placemakers, business and foundations need to work collaboratively because as we've already said, you know, the future is in young people, it's in children. And I think you're absolutely right, Alexander. We've completely designed out children. I think it's, you know, we're kind of, we're definitely at fault of that. If you just think about walking on the street, um, you know, the, the most, um, the dirtiest part of our air is right close to, you know, a pram, um, you know, one of the youngest humans that we have, which is absolutely crazy. And yet what we found in all of the projects we funded, including creative schools and so many others, um, is that children have, I think, this actually, we, they haven't been drowned out yet about whether they're artists or whether they're good at art or not. And they understand what a nice place looks like or feels like. And actually, they're much better at it often than adults. Unfortunately, they haven't got the power to do the designing. But if we were to listen to them, I think we'd have much better places to live in. Yeah, thank you. And then maybe it just leads us to an already often mentioned uh, SDG 11, the Sustainable Cities and Communities, which is kind of the necessary or the, the main SDG, the whole placemaking, whether it's called placemaking or not, activities circle around and being um, well attached to. and. Alexander, you already started off that as an urban planner, of course, you are also focusing on, um, on the quality of living in urban spaces. And you already mentioned the children, but there are, I guess, different or other approaches. You are also focusing with Spacescape to well, guarantee kind of a sustainable city and to improve the quality of living in cities, even though maybe it's not called placemaking. Yeah, okay, okay, but since this is the subject, maybe maybe I can uh, uh, take the opportunity to mention that I'm running a large project on streets, and we are trying to uh, create a new, like a new standard for uh, for sustainable, healthy streets in Sweden. And of course, that we we have a we are developing a toolbox for evaluating how good is the street basically and uh, we we have a for example we have one like a street function index where we just just count the number of functions the street has it, it's it's not so complicated i think you have to make things simple so so we just have a, have an index where you can count the number of functions uh, that the street ha have and and uh, then you can say if you transform the street from this to this uh, you will double the number of functions and then, of course, uh, that's a language where, which the engineers understand. <laughs> but uh, our starting point is, of course, that that we are up. We have a lot of functions which is connected to to placemaking, to city life, to like uh, the the value of uh, children playing in the street is as as is one function, and the car traffic is another function. So, <laughs> so we are like. Uh, Making uh, car traffic a mi minority interest <laughs> in, the, in the design process, to, so to speak. But I, I think really, um, maybe it's because I'm running this project right now. But 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 seriously, streets are the 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 the, the veins of a city. It's it's where everything comes together. It's where where all the uh, the, the 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 movement and 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 the city life and the technical stuffs and 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 the the vehicles everything comes together in the street and and we have to make smarter streets we have to make them more healthy much more greener uh, in in the future so so uh, for example just to make a simple just a simple idea to exchange every third parking lot to a tree. That would mean that we uh, in Sweden would have three million more street trees. So just just uh, or uh, I mean, if you take your city, how many how many parking places do you have for cars? If you exchange every third car to a tree, then you have 
you can uh, support your city with oxygen <laughs> for, or your citizens with oxygen for the future and so on. So, so I, I, I think you can, you can come up with a, 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 a great amount of indicators and numbers to support, but it does not, uh, it, 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 you, you have to do your, your, your uh, groundwork. You have to work with people. You have to talk to people. You have to make your uh, participation and, and so on. But to make, to, to, to make things come true, to make the, the politicians to decide for change, you have to come up with the, with the, with some numbers and data and, and evidence and so. On. So yeah, for the for the government and politics, data is everything. Uh, Jana, you just raised your hand. Do you want to add something? Uh, I don't know. Maria was uh, first, I guess. No, you you go first. Actually, mine was there before, but I'll, oh. I'll say something. I'll say something after you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Good. Well, maybe just uh, in addition to what you just said with the trees. I mean, there's a program running in Berlin from the Berlin Senate at the moment where. Um, uh, the 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 um, uh, inhabitants of the city of a certain area can um, ask for funding uh, where uh, they are supported to transform a parking lot into a green space. And that's, for example, a way of connecting um, two things like what what do they really want the 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 area to look like, the function, it makes the city also greener. It makes it more, um, more livable, and uh, also takes away one of the million uh, uh, parking spots in the in a in a city. So, um, I think what is really key is to connect different people and stakeholders to have politicians, uh, local authorities. Um, 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 developers and also, of course, uh, the people who live there and bring them to one table and exchange uh, interests and, and, you know, sometimes uh, what you scratch on the, <laughs> at your office is absolutely, it might sound well and it's logic because the numbers say it's logic, but if you ask like five people who live there, they might tell you something, a totally different story. So um, I think one can't go without the other. <laughs> so the, the cooperation between mm. all different kinds of stakeholders would be the answer in my opinion. So Maria, you'd like to add something? So yeah, um, I would agree with what's just been said about actually it needs, it needs both two sets of, of, of humans or sectors to work together. Um, I'm just thinking of examples. I think I saw a half question go up across the screen there. <laughs> and um, one of the things that, that we do at the foundation is to make sure that we work with um, investors or donors that actually also are absolutely focused on SDGs and sustainable developments. And with one of our um, funders, City of London, we set up something called um, Fusion Prize. And Fusion Prize was aimed at, at, at younger people um, but it was about how do you fuse those different requirements to create better cities? And um, as part of that, although there was a prize for the winners, actually we had more than 5,000 people turn up to workshops, share their ideas, um, start new projects, and for us to put them in touch with other areas where they might get additional support. And the winner was um, a, a group of young people um, early 20s, younger, called Play Nice. And now what they're doing is working with ESG-focused um, developers who are giving them space part-time and possibly, you know, into the future, long-term, co-designing outdoor spaces and indoor spaces as well, whether as cultural galleries or as parks and spaces for people to be in. And the second example is with um it's funded by Westville Stratford City and that's our East um, London Futures program and that about a quarter of that is funding local place making projects of specifically focusing on how you develop a place or a street which is comfortable um, but also brings in um, our invests in the local economy and again we've aimed that at younger people because we have for very young neighborhoods, but also we're focusing on intergenerational work. 
because I think Alex just said about, you know, years ago, decades ago, actually kids were playing on streets. And I think some children we've learned don't even know what that means anymore. To have those conversations historical and then moving into the future is a really healthy way of doing it. Thank you very much. Anna, you just raised your hand to also add something. You have to turn on your microphone, please. Constantly. Um, no, I just wanted to add to Alexander what he said before, like one big challenge uh, can really be to convince uh, both uh, politicians and people in charge to work with placemaking. Uh, and I think that for politicians, they feel like they are they have been elected. So um, it could be feel felt like a threat that someone else has the power of deciding something. Um, so um, from that point of view, it's it's um, really important to inform and educate them as well on the positive um, ways of it. And also people that has a, as a profession that they know how things should be done in the public space. They can also feel kind of threatened of letting go of the power a bit. So yeah, that's also a challenge from the municipality point of view. <laughs> And to add probably, Anna, you also in your experience um, that talking about the long lasting effects, right? To keep or to, to make a short term project into a long term project, as Alexander already also said, is it also what you said to educate politicians and the municipality on the abilities of placemaking in order to make it long term, to make it last? because they're not scared of it anymore to, and they will see the positive impact and make it last and don't remove it after a couple of days, weeks, months. I think it's, it's important to show them the positive effects and the long-term effects because there's a lot of things you can do with it. It's both for safety, sustainability, health. There's so many positive things that it can create. So I think it's, it's good to use evidence and <laughs> research. Also, great. Uh, I don't know, I, Maria or Alexander, you wanted to add something? Um, with the municipality part, I think it's worth remembering that, you know, it's political and people quite often lose their roles after a certain point in time, unless, they're, um, unless local communities feel that they actually got their back and their agendas. I think maybe in, in London, there's a big conversation around placemaking um, and it's been going for quite some time now. I think what we're finding is uh, actually municipalities or local authorities, as we call them, are actually really recognizing the value of placemaking, um, both in the long term and short term, as I said earlier, especially in regards to, to well-being. I think sometimes the people that are uh, kind of left off the hook or the sector is, is um, when we don't work with businesses more. So I, I feel the need to for us to be more what's the word, bold in working with commercial companies actually, because they have a lot of power about building, how things get built. And I think that certainly currently, again in London, but I think in the UK in general, there are a lot of large, very large, um, powerful um, developers who, who are rethinking the role of placemaking. And I think we should start knocking on some doors a little bit more about how we work with them. And I think quite a few of them are, are more open than we think. So it's not only about involving different communities within the city, but also big companies as part of the placemaking project. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Alexander, please. Yes, I, I, I'm very curious uh, to ask Maybe uh, it's uh, Maria and Jana from a European perspective, how, um, how you react or uh, what your, uh, your, your ideas about uh, a model developed in New York City, which called the Public Plaza Program. Uh, the idea was that the municipality has some money and they say, uh, you, the, you, the communities come with ideas. What places do you want to develop or uh, to, 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 to place make and then they have a like like a sort of a system where they prioritize um, uh, areas with the uh, low income areas uh, and, and, and so on and and then they they assign a contract with the local community uh, and uh, what they're doing is that they 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 pay for the uh, construction of the new 
public space, the, the, the plaza, uh, and the local community, be it companies or real estate uh, or, or um, community organization, they do the, um, the maintenance of the place. And so um, they, they have a, they, it, like, it's a kind of a public partner, private and public partnership. And I think it's very interesting since they cr actually created 70 zero seven new plazas in New York City with this program. And it seems to be very successful uh, and, and uh, a type of partnership where, 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 where you can gather all different interests and really uh, uh, make things uh, happen. So, so I would be, I'm very curious, would it work like in Berlin or in London? <laughs> I think there are projects like that happening in London, but I, I'm, I don't think to the same scale as, as you've just mentioned, Alex. Um, and I think it also depends, I guess, on the politics, but also the resources of each local authority or neighborhood as to whether they feel they can afford to do that. Um, I think there's more funding possibly going into those projects now again because of COVID-19, because if you if you were just even thinking about figures and not humanity, you know, it's actually cheaper to have someone walking through a clean and healthy park where they feel safe than actually putting them through various prescriptions, hospital, et cetera. So there are um, more place-making projects happening a little bit similar to the plaza, but I, I don't think quite at the same scale. I, I know City, um, City of London and City Hall are actually putting more funding definitely into place-making and regeneration um, and putting it through a social justice lens as well but I don't think we have quite the same program of work as, as seems to be happening in New York, but, but maybe one of my colleagues will tell me after this conversation that there is. Jana, maybe you can give an answer for Berlin. Uh, yeah, well, I'm not so familiar with the New York concept, but um, uh, in Berlin, what I've worked or I'm involved in two bigger projects uh, where um, actually um, um, uh, like a, a, actually a Swiss pension fund <laughs> bought certain uh, areas in Berlin and then gave as an investment of course but gave the the, um, the place to um, to uh, organizations uh, that would fit their um yeah they're like like based on the sdgs for example pretty much like it had to have a, a social aspect ec ecological aspect and so on so i have uh, we have quite a few projects like that um, um for example at the holzmarkt project where they build their uh, really like an urban um cultural uh, art and neighborhood area uh, with um, many yeah local um, yeah actors from 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 the local area actually that could participate and yeah and they they're given it for a hundred years and then of course the property the ground and any anything that's built on it will still belong to the to the uh, pension fund or the um, owners but uh, actually it can it makes it easier for um, actors who are not able to buy <laughs> a piece of land um, in Berlin to do, still develop it in a very social and ecological friendly way. So, Great, thank you. Maybe I can squeeze in a question from the chat um, because it, I think it really fits here. So the question is if you can, as you already did, offer any examples of placemaking measures that have, that have succeeded in attracting and engaging communities that are normally strangely absent or invisible in a place. And the example is that the person who asked the question lives on the tiny island of Malta and is, is of course surrounded by beaches with a significant population of sub-Saharan migrants. And he says, I once visited one of Malta's most popular and 
um, beaches with a friend from Eritrea. And although he had lived in Malta for eight years and as a taxi driver, had driven tourists to that site countless times, but neither he nor his Eritrean friends had ever set foot on the beach before. He loved it. Any examples of placemaking interventions that can make a place more welcoming to diverse groups, especially here we have the invisible groups. A question to all of you. Um, sorry, there's a, there's a piece of work that's been done by the National Heritage Lottery Fund, and it's looking at um, equality, diversity, inclusion in regards to heritage. And that's also green spaces um, and blue and gray spaces. So it's not just heritage buildings. And one of the things that, that we found certainly um, generally across the UK is that whilst these places might look really lovely for some people, actually for others, they um, don't feel included. The way in which they are made to feel when they're in a particular space means that they, they wouldn't want to go back there or even try it. Um, and that's in regards not only to um, young and older people, but, but also in regards to, you know, if you're young women, for example, um, many have said that they wouldn't necessarily go to a specific area, which everyone thinks is absolutely beautiful for them. Um, but for young women, actually, it's, it might not be so comfortable, uh, mainly because sometimes it's, you know, a lot of men doing the hiking. Um, and also there's been lots of research which shows that a lot of um, black, Asian, ethnic minority groups uh, in the UK actually have felt excluded from the countryside and only now as a nation are we having that conversation. So it's, it's about actually a culture and how we all accept and work with each other um, and make people feel comfortable in a space and design in um, how people can feel comfortable in the space. So again, it's about involving different communities and to get their special needs or maybe why they are not using a certain space in order to get them attracted to a space or make them use the space for their own purposes. Exactly, yeah. 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 Anyone else of you want to maybe add an example or from your experience? Okay, so for the audience, just some of you are already using it, just the reminder that you're open to ask the questions. When it fits, I just put it in and then the other ones I will try to ask at the end so that all of your questions are answered by this great panel. And um, we already talked a lot about places and getting um, different communities committed to certain spaces and attracted to certain spaces with the help of placemaking. And um, of course, when we are talking about sustainability, we, I, in my opinion, also have to talk about uh, the, the responsible consumption and production. So we're not only talking about people, as a close group kind of, but also of course placemaking is interacting with different um, resources as well. It's not only people. And Jana, you're also a specialist in circular economy and working a lot of that and on that one. And what is your special approach when you talk about um, responsible consumption and then looking forward to placemaking? Where's the connection for you? Mm, maybe I can. <laughs> Uh, come up with an example from my work um, uh, in Neukölln, where uh, we have a very high um, amount of waste and littering uh, on the street. And it's actually uh, the, the, the local authority uh, research that it's like one third of Berlin's waste is dumped in Neukölln and that specific area, which is really a lot. And that this um, also costs uh, four and a half million euro each year just to get rid of that extra garbage. So the local authority really had an, an, an interest in changing that. And um, that was the moment where we kind of stepped, stepped in and tried to um, figure out ways to um, make the, uh, on the one hand side, lower the, the waste and step, but also like 
um, grabbing the problem at its root, <laughs> not only uh, get rid of the waste, but also not uh, producing so much waste. So we started a project where we um, um, talk to local uh, gastronomy uh, businesses and other businesses and, and try to figure out uh, uh, ways to make their, um, their production or their um, packaging. Uh, and you know, all know those coffee cups that are very <laughs> lying around everywhere. And since COVID-19, we, um, and the eating outside, it, it has become even a bigger problem, like the, the food packaging and, and coffee and to go drinks. Um, and so we found out uh, ways to help them and how to support them to um, uh, switch their systems into more sustainable packaging or even refund systems. That was our approach. And we figured out what the barriers were, why they wouldn't switch to those kind of systems and then we could uh, realize um, a pilot project with the local authority to um, kickstart uh, the switch to a refund system for example and that really made a big big impact actually because um, like re re refund systems only work if there are many on board otherwise there's no you can get rid of your cup anywhere so uh, yeah so we uh, again work together with all kinds of actors um, uh, the local gastronomies who really know their customers the best who really you know are the ones who struggle a lot also with all the um, yeah with not so so much um, money <laughs> and uh, the local authority who really also benefited double-sided you know the city is cleaner they uh, have less costs on getting rid of the uh, waste and also making it more sustainable which also benefits uh, the city and the citizens at the first place and of course it helps that the places where people like to stay especially during corona they are not completely filled up with rubbish and the quality of the place isn't there anymore because it feels like a garbage place yeah. yeah, great. Um, Alexander, you are, as an urban planner, of course, the green strategies um, also, I guess, play a big role in your daily work. And um, you already mentioned the trees in the streets, but um, what are different approaches from your side to make it um, to be more responsible in the urban planning, in planning cities and um, yeah, make them more um, yeah, sustainable in that case. Can, can you can you be a bit more specific in your question? What what, is, what was the question? The, I, I would like to put them in in. I don't want don't like the word green, but green is a big topic in sustainability. So environmental friendly and urban planning really changes a lot into the direction that it also has to be environmentally friendly and green. Maybe it's only green washing in some times, but um, so from your perspective as urban planner, so the, the responsibility of consumption and production in living together in the city, make it green. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, uh, I, I interpret this in, in, in this way uh, because I think the biggest waste that we have in our public space today uh, are uh, the car uh, are the cars. I mean, that's the biggest uh, waste problem. <laughs> we have to get we have to get rid of those tons of uh, uh, metallic boxes that fill up our street. And um, uh, some say, oh, it can't be done. It's uh, people are get you know when you take away parking spaces, people will get frustrated and angry and it's a politically impossible but we know that I mean, there are great examples now nowadays and especially with the pandemic that it can be done because people see the 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 fantastic uh, value that are created when you take away cars park cars cars that are just standing there just taking up space and also car traffic which is creating a lot of like danger and and harm and death 
and and and, and I mean to 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 uh, to people in in the in the city. So uh, I um, I mean take for the biggest city in the world, Tokyo. They have basically no car parking in the streets, and it's a quite I mean that city works quite well. And we have a lot of city districts in Europe where uh, we I mean the central city district in Stockholm is is car free it, it it's uh, and there are so many examples in Europe of car free districts that work extremely well so it's just I think uh, Paris is an example they are going very forward on this uh, taking away a lot of like I think it was like half of the parking spaces and and going in with green and and other stuffs in the streets I I, I think this is a major thing of course the um, the waste issue that jana brought up is is very interesting but if and and it, that has to be solved of course but i think the more acute problem to people to people's health to the, to the inequalities and 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 even to them I mean, to the economies we know that if you take away cars the uh, land will become more valuable so uh, if uh, it's just an example, I, I, I did a, like a calculation. What would happen if we lower the speed limits on the 50 kilometer per hour streets to 30 kilometer per hour streets? Then you would create in Swedish cities, you would create uh, like 30 billion euros of value. This means that the speed limit on our streets is actually is actually um, hiding or like it's it pushing down value creation because it's just it creates our cities so uh, much worse in in quality of life and and so on so so to me to me the biggest uh, environmental problem the, the, the biggest environmental challenge we have is 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 is, is the car traffic and to me yeah so tra traffic planning in general is um, also comes together with the topic of being responsible uh, in the consumption by maybe not everybody needs to own a car but you can share a car and uh, or yeah. use public yeah. transport or use your bike um, yeah yeah and e-scooters and I'm in the sharing economy there's so many uh, possibilities now to to solve your mobility needs without owning a car yourself and with the digitalization like the 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 um the e retail and so on of course that poses another challenge because shops are leaving from the city center and then uh, then we have to think of a what 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 can we do with those spaces? Uh, I, I also, I'm very curious because we have, we we hear rumors about London, for example, that the shops are leaving the city center and so it's it's a, like it's all dead and it's a catastrophe. It would be interesting to to hear from the stores. Like, uh, is is really the e retail e commerce uh, thing? Is it really killing the public spaces? Yeah. It's killing some public spaces, um, especially in areas where people are economically struggling um, because, you know, you don't go shopping if you haven't got food in the fridge. Um, but I think some of the other cities who actually probably have um, quite wealthy um, residents are still going shopping and it really depends on where you are and what the demographics are. Um, certainly in London, it's picking up again. We, we had a, a bad time, especially the arts and culture sector um, and also the catering. I mean, almost every sector actually got really slammed because no one could go anywhere. Um, I think what we found, though, is that people were able to, in some ways, without cars, um, go places they hadn't thought about before because they didn't, you know, the cars weren't there. And they said, well, actually, it's not that far to walk. Let's, let's do that. 
Um, and I was surprised at how many people I saw in walks I hadn't seen before. I think the only thing about the circle economy is just making, well, it's absolutely crucial, but just making sure that we run it through a, a lens of equality. So incentives for bikes, absolutely right. Um, but then bikes cost something. So, um, you know, and if we're talking about people going onto trains and buses, actually that can be quite expensive if you're a big family. Um, there's cases now, or there were, there were there was a suggestion that um, in London, we'd stop paying for children to have free travel over a certain age. I think it was 16 or 17. And that, that's been changed for the moment, but there was you know, lots of young people from, from poor income, from low income families, who are actually quite honestly saying, we're not sure how we're going to get our kids to school anymore. Um, and so definitely free or cheap, um, Public transport is absolutely crucial, but also I'm thinking of people that I know who have, who are differently able, differently abled or disabled, who would say, actually, that's not an excuse to us. We also need to think about the vehicles that we can use um, and get us around, which might well be a car. Mm. Yes, of course. Yeah, that's a big topic, of course, not to lose equality by uh, changing traffic systems in our city. Um, Anna, you already raised your hand to add something. This is just a really quick add because we're talking about travel now a lot, but I think if we, we create these uh, wonderful places, uh, it has a potential of actually making people travel less because I think at least some of my friends, they always look forward to their like travel going abroad somewhere because there's not enough fun things happening maybe where they live. So I think if we create these places together with people, I think maybe people can appreciate their everyday life more and hopefully uh, travel more sustainably and not as often. So just wanted to add that placemaking is good for almost everything in sustainability. <laughs> so great, so we can finish off here. No, just kidding. Um, um, but maybe Anna, to continue with you also that um, you said in the introduction, que introducing question that um, education is really important and responsibility is also about having targeted knowledge transfer, not always to start up new, but also to uh, look back off, uh, on, on older experience and to take the learnings from there to the next project and yeah, to have the knowledge transfer whether it is from one community to the other, or is it from, uh, from the placemaker community to the municipality and so on. And um, yeah, you said it was important, it was your introduction, but you had to keep it short. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that why it is so important to use this, to be responsible with this knowledge in order to have a sustainable placemaking. I think this is something that I've been to so many presentations and I don't think they about placemaking and like what is the work that you really do when you're a placemaker because <laughs> when I was in Uppsala the first thing I needed to do was to get out there and network it takes a lot of time to find all these people that you're going to collaborate with uh, so I think this takes this is the biggest effort you make in the beginning so when you get this network, this is when the work starts. And then you start doing things with the network. And through those activities, you get people on board. So then you can really do things and do it sustainably in long term. So I think that is <laughs> something that you really need to focus on. But what I've been thinking about a lot also is because there are a lot of consultants and placemaking that come in and do things that can be really wonderful, but then when they disappear, what happens? So it's really important to, to educate. As I said, if you come from the outside, it's even more important because you're gonna leave. So to educate and then maybe you have to support it a bit if people are gonna do placemaking on their own, but uh, also not always creating this big, events or activities that costs a lot of money because if you work as I've been doing in the municipality there are a lot of things happening uh, like now in the culture and leisure departments 
there's a lot of kids doing performances with their cultural schools or associations that want to show off and find new members. So like trying to use the resources and activities that already happens and then to try to localize them to the spaces that you want to work with. Then you have something that's constantly going to happen there and you don't have to put more money in your budget for that. So I think trying, that's also kind of reuse, I think, like using the resources that are already there. And also that, that means that you connect it to the community also because it's the community creating the activities as well. And mostly for, from my department then youth and kids. So I don't know if that's <laughs> was all, but there's a lot of things to be said about this, but yeah. yeah it's Knowledge is crucial. Knowledge transfer is crucial for placemaking. One more thing I could say about that is um, because I've been working mostly at um, urban development departments, uh, but now I'm in the culture and leisure. The biggest shock for me was to see that the structures are so different. Or I would even say that there's not that much structures in culture and leisure. So. Um, the key to be able to collaborate and do placemaking well is to understand the structures of the ones you uh, collaborate with, either if it's in the different departments on a municipality, but also associations, private organizations. Um, because if you don't understand that, then it's really hard to collaborate and to, to, to create the uh, actions uh, on the terms of the partners you have. So they are able to, to be a part of it. That is really important. So learn, <laughs> learn about your collaborators. Yeah, perfect. So before um, we have three more questions from the audience and before we start off into the questions and getting kind of to the end of our panel, um, Maria, just one last question from you. We were coming from the committed communities and that we need to involve the people and um, but also we were talking about that there's a lot of knowledge that we, it's already gained during experience. And maybe you can elaborate a little bit on um, how the reuse, it sounds a little bit, I don't know, not so nice, but the reuse of ideas, people and spaces can lead to sustainability. And how is placemaking especially a tool for reusing certain things? Um, so gosh, it's a long question. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of things, but I think the first one is that um, when we work um, collaboratively, we've got to recognise that it's passing over the power. So um, it's not necessarily us that are going to be doing the project, it's the person with the knowledge and we help with the skills and the resourcing. Um, and in regards to reusing knowledge, um, I think it's more that you recognize the knowledge and work with the individual or the group that actually has got the ideas and you try and support that. Um, but also just to flag up, I'm sure people know this, is that you have to do it long term, you have to be full time commitment because otherwise you lose allies when you go in and you basically what feels like to a potential um, partner that you've stolen an idea, no, appropriation. So um, I think what we need to do is, is a little less of that quick and fast, but more a bit of the slow and resourced. Um, and in a way it's easier for me to say that because the foundation does give out funding to make sure that happens. But what we're also finding is that projects last longer um, and also communities can then manage a program on their own. Um, but I think the whole part of um, the role of culture and placemaking, um, it depends whether one sector respects the other. And I, I think for us at East Bank, which is a new cultural quarter in, in East London, the whole idea was built around collaboration across environments, um, i.e. the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, um, the four boroughs, the four local neighbourhoods, but also, you know, some absolutely major cultural partners. And I guess there was a blueprint then for how we could work together. And I think that's the kind of thing that we all need to do in placemaking, whether it's quick and fast or really long term. 
Um, and then I would also say that we should be asking for more commercial funding. I don't think we do that enough. And that's because it can be difficult. But I think now at the time when we're all talking about net zero, and I think that some of the, as I said, construction companies, but also completely different organizations such as retail are also keen to start actually funding in placemaking. And I think what they like is collaborative working um, so that they're not funding the one project, which is very similar to another, for example. So I would say, um, make sure you have everyone at the table, make sure it's resourced and try your best to make sure it's resourced long-term. Um, and when you use someone else's knowledge, you make sure that you recognize it um, and don't run off with it. Yeah, intellectual property also is an issue with placemaking. Yes, it can be counter. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So to um, close the panel down, I'd like to ask some questions from the audience to you. And I think it really fits in what we are talking about right now. So one question is, also, if the panelists could share processes, practices that move beyond becoming with sharing ideas, such deep engagement requires time, which many citizens are poor and falling on from above, that above can then create inequi in, oh, sorry, inequitable situations between professionals and citizen experts. So, of course, placemaking requires a lot of um, yeah, taking your free time and investing in it. So the, this balance maybe of paid and unpaid work and placemaking. So the question is for everybody and whoever wants to answer, or of course, not only one person, but few of you, please feel free. I can kind of kick off. Um, and that's to say is that you don't. So when we do projects or we fund projects, we make sure that all the local communities are resourced and that's financially as well and that they have everything that they need to have an equal seat at the table. Um, it's, it's, it's the only investment you can do to really get inclusive, sustainable places. Um, and also what we do is that before we even design a program but around place or arts and culture, we see if there's a need for it. That's one thing. And then the other thing, we also say, what programs should we be funding and who else agrees with you and what resources would, it, would you need to put into this and how can we make sure that you're not um, you know, economically suffering because you've been involved or your ideas have been stolen. So I think it has to be an ethical framework around this, that communities shouldn't be expected to do everything for free while some of us are lucky enough to have a salary to do it. I, I just don't think that's appropriate. Yeah, Alexander, you also wanted to add something. Um, yes, maybe um, another aspect of uh, um, participation and placemaking is uh, what are the means for everyone to get heard. I mean, we're talking now a lot about uh, talking to, I mean, asking people, talking, but we have to know what people or the community or the neighborhood, what they think and what are the techniques? How, how do we approach them? How, we, how, how do we involve people? And uh, I think we cannot, um, uh, we cannot set aside the thing that we we, we all are in parts like in the digital world. So there, that's why I, I, um, I developed this platform for neighborhood uh, participation called Place to Plan, which is kind of a sort of an Instagram or a, some sort of Twitter for placemaking and planning. And, and uh, my, I think my view is that when maybe you have another view of this, but my view is that that if you uh, invite people to say their opinion, what they want, what what they want with the neighborhood, with with some places, um, if you have a platform where everyone can share their ideas, maybe on a map or a plan, um, then it becomes, um, if, if you do that also anon uh, uh, anonymously, <laughs> um that it be also become more of a a um a, a democ 
or like a more flat or democratic feel that everyone's opinion is important. It's because there are challenges when you're a group of people say in a room, if you have a workshop or a community meeting, there's always like who is speaking and, and uh, who, who stands up and raises his or her voice and, and so on. And, and so I, I think we could use, if we use them wisely, we could use um, platforms to, uh, to, to gather people's ideas and have them as a com like complementary to face-to-face -face meetings or face-to-face -face me workshops. So, so I, I'm also a bit curious about what, what you uh, um, think. With, uh, how, I mean, uh, what are the challenges and, and how we should use these kind of um, digital um, tools to talk to uh, for, for placemaking or for place research or place dialogue? We, we, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying that I think we should use all those tools, but we also have to think of the people who are not um, using the internet and who are not at that point. So um, I think there would be multi multiple um, forums necessary to really uh, reach everyone. Like for example, the elderly people, I'm not so sure if they would adapt to a platform like that. So then also make sure that you have something um, that they can participate to. Again, um, using the digital world, of course, it's not inclusive for everybody. Yeah, in London, we found that a lot. Um, you know, children couldn't go to school anymore because of COVID nineteen, and um, it was heart rendering to see how many families couldn't even didn't even have a, a phone, let alone being able to do their classes. So the digital, digitalization is really crucial, but it, it needs we need to make sure that every, everyone has the resources to do that. Um, and then we need to look at it across the demographics. And again, for the elderly, that doesn't necessarily work for everyone or younger people. Um, but I do think we need to think about digitalization, but I'm thinking and I'm trying to remember the author. I think her family name is Perez and she wrote about digitalization and how it can be warped depending on who's putting the data in and who's responding. So we just need to be aware of that too. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I've, I've been also, I, I, I work in both worlds. Like I've been to the community meetings where you talk about uh, like how to develop a neighborhood. And there are like people from age from uh, 70 to 80 and no one else in the room. <laughs> but, so so it's, uh, it's, I think, I, I think um, I, I would, take the, the opinion here that the opportunities are larger for, for, for uh, being more democratic if we can use the digital tools, we can reach more people than we did before. Uh, and of course, use them wisely and, and, and see like who, who, who try to understand who is, who is talking and, and so on. But um, my experience is that we, in, in, uh, in many projects, we can see a, a wide range of people using the tools and, and both young people and old, old people. And, and we have done workshops with, for example, we do, we're doing workshops uh, at schools with quite small children and they have using the computers in the school and, and they're doing workshops and writing, doing drawings of what they like with a future street and so on. Uh, and then they upload it in the platform so everyone can see. So there's also a thing that they can directly share what they are, have been doing and share to a lot mm -hmm. of other people. So it becomes a shared knowledge platform. It's not only what is said in the room, that it stays in the room, it's directly shared to ev for everyone to see. And that I think is a, uh, a very um, particular value of these uh, platforms. Anna, you wanted to add also something, you raised your hand. Yeah, and I think um, these kind of maps are really great. I, I've heard something similar many, many years ago from someone working in the Netherlands where you could kind of find a spot and um, promote a project there and people would vote for that project and then it got built. 
Um, but I think it's good to combine because I think the strength of the placemaking is also that you work in a place in a neighborhood where people live and not talking about having meetings indoors certain times, but having meetings in that space, doing activities in that space and having a dialogue at the same time. Because that's what I did some uh, with some stuff in, uh, in Uppsala municipality. We had like concerts and dance performances and try out different sports. At the same time, we were talking about what's going to happen in this park in the future. And we had a big map and we stood there and like okay so do you want a stage we have a stage now here with performances is this something you want in this park or do you have another idea but by being in that space and experiencing how this activity um, happens in the space and if you like it or not then, then it's easier to start imagining what can happen there so I think it's important to not lose being in the space which is the place making so so maybe using place to plan at that kind of um, activity as well like using the digital in the physical space and you can also connect them and you can also inform people about place to plan for example because maybe everyone doesn't know about it <laughs> yeah. so yeah so um at this point, unfortunately, we kind of have to have to wrap it up because we're running out of time and we're just now um, like stretching on topic digital placemaking, physical space placemaking, where's the intersection, where's the difference. I think we could set up a whole new panel on that one because it's a huge topic, of course, and um, there's lot, a lot of more things to discover when it comes to placemaking. And um, yeah, I just really want to say thank you for this great panel uh, talking about the sustainable impact of placemaking and we, we um, tackle topics like it is really necessary to educate for knowledge transfer it's really important to have sustainable placemaking to make it sustainable we also have to think about what fits the place so it's about the context which is important to make it sustainable from a short term to a possible long-term effect of course, it is about involvement and participation, because if you don't uh, tackle the issues of the people being associated or in that certain space, there is no sustainability if it doesn't fit their need and to make them the place their own. So ownership is really important as well. And of course, the social value of certain spaces, thinking about groups of people maybe who are not safe or secure in a certain space to see why that is or to make to bring new groups to a certain space and of course um sdgs are a big topic but as jana maybe mentioned before is that the sdgs were in place making before they were named sdgs and before it was named sustainability and then um, it feels to me like there's a lot of things going on which are placemaking, which aren't named placemaking. And so it's still kind of a new topic, placemaking to many people. They haven't heard of it, even though they're practicing placemaking and they're practicing sustainable placemaking, which kind of gives me hope for the development of our cities and communities and to look into a future where cities and places are livable and um, fitting the needs of people in communities and bring people together to create resilience in our cities. And I think this is really important for the future and the future of the future, as Maria said before. And I think it's really important to have that really long view on things. And yeah, I really, really want to say thank you, Maria, Anna, Jana and Alexander for your and perspectives on those topics for your input and for sharing everything. I'd like to say thank you to the audience for asking questions because it's always important to also get the questions and to get the people involved. And I just want to make um, a little advertising here that we also have a third panel on place in the placemaking forum, which is next Friday, October 29th. And it is, I think it also fits to this one, about community building and the governance of placemaking. And as we said, community is almost everything about placemaking. I think it's also a really interesting topic, uh, which my colleague Matthias Rauch will host. And 
yeah, so far from us, my side again, thank you very much. Even though it was only in the digital space, um, I was really happy meeting you. And um, thank you for being involved and thank you for being placemakers and make our cities and uh, spaces livable for the um, for, for us, for the people, for the community. So thank you and goodbye and hope to see you at a certain time in real person.